This is a podcast by Wellhouse Church, where certain things are fixed, the essentials of faith, and the best beer is served on tap, while everything else is just a matter of perspective. What's cracking, beer lovers? What's up, everybody? How we doing? All right. I want to drink some beer. Let's do it. You first. So, I have a beer that I'm super interested in. It's by Boulevard Brewing Company. It's from the Smokestack series, which honestly, I don't know what that is. I'm going to have to look that up. But it's their double IPA. It's called the Calling IPA. Yep. And this is what the kind of marketing tagline is. One malt, eight hops, yep. and boundless determination. The description of it says, The Calling is the undeniable IPA we were driven to make. It's our tribute to like-minded dreamers, adventurous spirits, and half, glass full, half and glass half full optimists. Heed your call and enjoy. So I love everything that I've had from Boulevard. Um, I don't know if I've had anything from them. I don't remember it. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite barrel ages, uh, Amber's are from them. Mm. Um, and, well, that would make sense that I don't remember it because uh, I don't really like that style. Yeah. I love everything I've had from Boulevard. I'm excited about it. Eight different hops. Yeah. As somebody who homebrews a lot, I think the most we've ever put in is four. Yeah, I think so. So I also have a repeat brewery. <clears throat> the East Brothers Beer Company again um, from Richmond, California. This is their red lager. Oh, um, it's 4.6. Um, and it's a Vienna style amber with uh, biscuity malt presence, clean, crisp, familiar. Eventually your ship comes in um, and it tells the story of the East, East brother beer company. Um, so I remember I had one of their other beers before. I can't remember what it was, but I remember really enjoying it. Interesting. Oh, it was the pills. It was their pills. That's what okay. it was. This is their red lager. I'm super excited. Nice. Cheers, buddy. Cheers, man. Mine headed up real bad. Ooh, <clears throat> that's Yummo. Yeah, it's good. Um, yeah, I actually think I like. Interesting. I like it being a double. Yeah. Because yes, the hops are very forward, but the eight different strand of hop variety gives it makes it a much more mellow kind of mm. hop forward experience than like the one or two single just like jam it right Pushed. down your throat yeah. hop yeah. experience. So this um, is just more balanced and more well-rounded. Much more balanced. Yeah. Um, I do remember that about the calling. Um, is it was just a very balanced IPA. Yeah, holy mess. Um, ooh. Yeah. Um, that's an eight. Um, I need to think about... We got an eight, people. It's going to be an eight and then some. I just need to figure out what the end some is. All right. Uh, that is a very good beer. Yeah. I thoroughly enjoy mine as well. Um, it What is on the can is what you should expect. Mm, a nice traditional red lager. Yeah. Um, just very... Middle of the road, the Vienna style is very present. Mm, yeah. Like it's definitely Vienna, um, but that's kind of what I want out of a red. If yeah, I'm yeah, being yeah, honest, you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that clean, clean, crisp, familiar thing. Yeah, um, it reminds me of Killian's in a way. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I I I a little like, bit more clean than Killian's is, but it, yeah. My so my favorite kind of style of red loggers is irish reds yeah uh and which killian's is right um so i yeah i'm here for that 
Um, seven five. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a good like what average middle of the road kind of score for you. Yeah, uh, yeah. it's it's not anything too weird, too funky. Um, which honestly, whenever I picked it up, I was expecting just middle of the road red. You know what yeah. I mean? Like just yeah, normal yeah. red. <clears throat> and that and they delivered, so I'm cool. It's a good beer. I think I made four on this. Um, Eight four. <clears throat> I think I made four. I really like Can't it. Swap. Sure. Oh, that's a t-shirt idea. Can swap. Yeah. Nice. Can swap. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like. Ooh. I like the mellow element of the hops and I like the way they're highlighting each other. I do think there's something. I think I wish the malt were, I think I, I want more from the malt. I think that's the only reason it's not a nine for me. It's way more fruity on the nose than I remember. Yeah. I, I want more from the malt. Hmm. I think I think I get what you're saying. <clears throat> Did not like that. That is really sweet. I do not like sweet beers if you've not figured it out. I don't think that this is really um, sweet at all. That tastes really sweet to me. <clears throat> it's got like a high level bond malt to it, but I don't think it's sweet. Well, it's not going to have a high level bond malt because the level bond goes by color. Um, I mean... But it's it got that roasted malty flavor that you would get. Yeah, but I know. want when I get that, I want more butter. I want more savory kind of flavor. And I feel like a lot of that roasted malt stuff ends up more like sugary caramely mm -hmm. kind of which I don't I don't like as much. Mm -hmm. I, I want the kind of toasted roasted buttery flavor. Mm -hmm. The savory notes, not the sweet ones. Uh, um, I got you. That sounded like Ooh, it felt good. It did feel good. All right. So last week, we started a conversation about the knowledge of God. Yep. And specifically, what does God know or not go know about what's going on in the world? Um, and I told you that there are a few verses that you could point to that talk about God's knowledge, but yep. they're much less, significantly less than his power and significantly harder to deal with in the narrative. And in that conversation, you made the comment, well, if God is all powerful, doesn't that naturally mean he can give himself omniscience? Right. If he didn't have it before, can't he do that? Right. And that evokes a very difficult question because now that's a question of the relationship between knowledge and power. Right. <clears throat> Historically, do those things go hand in hand? That's actually a really good question. Because um, I want to say yes. But I don't think that that is, I don't know. Um, knowledge does not mean power. Or knowledge means power, but power does not mean knowledge. Yeah. Does that make sense? But historically, have world powers not only been the most powerful, but also the most knowledgeable? Yes. Okay. Politically speaking, yeah. It is significantly easier to maintain your power if you have supreme knowledge. Yes. And so I think, especially in Anselm's world, right? You got to remember mm -hmm. philosophy, Greek kind of yeah. culture. It's all about knowledge. And, and so Anselm, he needs God to be all powerful and all knowing. Yes. And the creeds speak to the power of God. Right. The creeds speak to the presence of God. Do not speak to the knowledge of God. They do not. Yeah. They are absent about the knowledge of God, unless you want to include the knowledge of God in the statement almighty for the power of God. And this is the other thing I will say. 
in these conversations, I'm asking you to wrestle with some very deep, like high level theological conversation. Right. But really what I'm more so asking you to do is not just so much wrestle with it, but I'm also asking you to evaluate what it, what picture it paints about your understanding of God that you need that from God. Right. Because if you need God to be all powerful and you need God to be all knowing, that's a very different idea than saying I need God to be the most powerful and I need God to be the most knowledgeable. Right. <clears throat> saying those things are very different than yes. saying supreme omnipotence and omniscience. Right. Um, that's the difference that I would be making. Right. I'm not questioning that God's the most powerful being in creation or in existence. I'm not questioning the fact that God's the most knowledgeable being in, in existence. Sense, yeah. It's a question of the supremacy of each of those as he sits today. Because if you've listened to this podcast very long, you know that I'm a fan of Jürgen Moltmann. Yeah. Jürgen Moltmann is a Christian. He's a panentheist. And he's also the guy that's kind of made famous the idea of the self-limitation of God. Right. And so basically what he says, and an easy place to point to in this would be Philippians 2. Okay? So Philippians 2 is a very famous passage. It's about Christ. Okay? And it's the Christ hymn. So beginning in verse 1, if then there's any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the tongue, and every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In that, we see the ability in the person of Jesus to empty themselves of a, a piece of their power. In emptying yourself of some of your power, there's still exaltation. Right. He's still exalted to the place of supreme power. Right. But for a season, Jesus lives without supreme power. Jürgen Moltmann says that that can be transposed onto God the Father. That God the Father can can for a season lay down his power so that he might enter into relationship, intimate relationship with his people, going from uber transcendent God, mm -hmm. all powerful and all knowing, to, excuse me, to uber imminent God who is in intimate relationship and suffers alongside his people. So here's a question. We always like to talk about transcendence and eminence as like a one or the other. Mm -hmm. Is there maybe some way that we could reconcile this as like it being on a scale? If you can, it's an ever moving one. Right. That, well, that's kind of what I mean. Like depending on um, how God reveals himself to certain people or, you know what I oh, mean? Oh, like, so you mean like uber subjective? Maybe. I'm not sure because I don't, I don't think that 
for me, God's own self-limitation is not like, oh, today I'm going to give more of it and tomorrow I'm going to pull more back. Mm -hmm. For me, God's self-limitation is God picked a moment in history and he said, hey, what I'm like currently doing, I want something different. Now, whether that's at Genesis 3, whether that's at Noah, whether right. that's at Babel, whether that's at Abraham, whether that's at Jesus, at Pentecost, at wherever that is, at some point throughout history, God made a decision that said, hey, I'm going to lay down a piece of my power because I want to be in relationship with these people. They need me. And so I'm going to be in intimate relationship with them. And so in order to do that better and suffer and feel and be present with them in the way that they need me so that I can understand and empathize and be in, be a better relationship partner with them, I'm going to lay down a portion of my power, whatever portion that is, right? I don't think God laid it all down. I don't think right. God's like in danger of being defeated by some cosmic force of evil. Right. But I do think God has laid down a piece of his power um, awaiting the time that he says, okay, I'm ready to end all of this. And he picks it up again. So he's back to being the supreme being of creation, of existence, and culminating the restoration movement that he started. And so for me, it's like whenever God chose to lay down his power, he laid that portion of power down for everyone. It's not a variable movement right. in that way. Like God, God today has a certain amount of power for me and for you the same. Now, the way in which God uses that and manifests himself may be very different, right. but it's the same level of power <clears throat> for everyone, mm -hmm. of which I think God's knowledge has been impacted by. I'm not saying that I don't think at one point God may have known everything. You're thinking at this, like he might have laid that part down. I, I think there, for me, there are bigger questions in the narrative about God's knowledge than there are God's power. Right. Um, but I think today... And specifically in the biblical narrative, God's knowledge is uh, limited. Mm. I think that's pretty clear to me. Um, but I don't think that's because God is somehow lacking. Right. I think God has chosen for relationship to lay down power and knowledge. That actually, that actually seems to make a lot of sense because you think about the last verse in Revelation, right? I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, mm -hmm. right? Both moments where he was the ultimate supremacy. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, although that is not really mentioned in the middle parts there. Actually, what we see is Jesus in the middle part and setting power down to be in relationship. Well, and, and not just laying power down, but going to the lowest level of power. Right. Um, I mean, Jesus is poor. Yeah. Like, Jesus is not a political power. Jesus doesn't have influence. Jesus is a, a carpenter from a family in a village of 200 people in the ancient world. Yeah. Um, there's literally nothing special about him. Right. Except that he's Jesus, like, Emmanuel. Right. And so, for me, I think, you know, and we'll, we'll talk about it next week about why I think this conversation is valid. Because if you ascribe to God full power and full knowledge, you're making claims about God bigger than what you think you're making. Because everyone would also say that somehow God must be good and just. Yeah. If you give supreme knowledge and supreme power, goodness or supreme goodness and supreme justice enter a conversation that one must give. Right. Um, 
due to the immense amount of brokenness and trauma present in the world. Uh, and if the ultimate good and ultimate just God was also all-powerful and all-knowing, then shouldn't his justice and goodness take over mm. to fix the brokenness? Yeah. And so I think, and that that's going to be the conversation next week, but how, how why this is such an important conversation, because... I, I do think you put yourself in a bit of a box. Right. If you go down this road, if, if you enter down a path where you say, hey, I need God to be all-powerful and all-good, I mean all-powerful and all-knowing, okay, well, there, that's going to come to a head at a moment. Right. And when that, when that moment is, is it's moments of crisis. It's right. moments of trauma. It's moments where I needed God and God was absent. And so now you've got, you enter this place where it's like, okay, did God fail me? Mm. Um, because, look, if you're looking for encouragement in the text, you're going to find it. Right. Um, like, you're going to be able to find things like, anything you ask in my name, I'll give to you. Right. Um, and so that's great, but, like, what happens when that's not true? Right. What do I do now? Why is that not true? Um, yeah. I and mean, we've all been there, right? Yeah. It's like, and and you can be in this moment of trauma or crisis, and you can say, God, I, I, I know this is not of you. I need you to fix this. Right. And God doesn't fix it. And it's like, okay, now what do I do? Right. This is why that conversation or that is why this conversation is important because I do think let me let me present to you a metaphor. Okay. Who's the most powerful person that you are two people removed from? The most powerful person that I'm most two people removed from? Mhm. Mm or three people removed from? Like three relationship joins gets you to the most powerful person that you know. I need to think about this. Um, mm. Like in true relationships, people that you could call tomorrow mm. and they could call their person tomorrow and they could call their person tomorrow. Who's the person at the top? Who's the person at the top? President of Lee College. Ted Cruz. Wow. Now, please don't hear that as a brag. It's not. Um, but he's a very powerful man. Yeah. Um, how accessible is the president of Lee College to you? Actually, she does a really good job of being accessible. No, so. no, no. No, that that's not what I mean in oh. that if, if you needed her, could she be available because she's also an employer of you. Right. So that, that's not super helpful because you have a natural infrastructure right. that makes her accessible. Yeah. Ted Cruz is not accessible to me one bit. No, not at all. Not a lick. Because power makes you unaccessible. Right. No, I guess that's true. And that's why Anselm has to do all these other things about God's presence. Yeah. Because he knows that power means lack of accessibility. Right. So, if you take away power, what happens? Accessibility is more right. achievable. Yeah. Hmm. I can be more approachable i can be more accessible to these people if i don't if i don't have all this power yeah now of course it's a metaphor right sure. it's going to break down eventually but i th i think that the transcendence of god the knowledge of god the power of god like these elements the transcendental elements of god i mean even just in the way we do it metaphorically like god is up there mm -hmm. which means he's even less accessible Right. than if he's sitting right there. Right. And so 
we all have this choice to make. And this is what we're going to talk about next week. And this is why I think this is a valuable conversation. Is you, you have, you said, can we put them on a scale? Mm. You have the transcendence of God and you have the eminence of God. Transcendence being the power, the almighty, the, the above us controlling everything. Mm -hmm. And the eminence being God being present, God suffering, God feeling, God experiencing alongside you. And there's a, a scale. Is it a scale or a spectrum? I could take the metaphor either way. Um, okay. Go with the scale. Let's go with spectrum. There's a spectrum of which you have to build your theology somewhere on this spectrum. Mm -hmm. The more power you give to God... The less the eminent less he eminent he becomes, yeah. and the less power you give to God, the more eminent he becomes. Yeah. Now, and you may not even have known to think through this all the way, right? But I mean, the ultimate metaphor of the transcendence of God is the peasant walking into the king's court to make a petition. That's the ultimate level. Like that would be a uber like hyper reformed view of God. Right. That all I can do is make a petition, but really God's going to make whatever decision he wants. He's already chosen to make. Yeah. And then you would have like the other part where like God's so imminent that he has no power and he's just a mutual friend that can only kind of help you out when they have the availability. Right. Which that is not where I want you to be at yeah. all. Um, you need God somewhere on this spectrum and wherever you choose to put him is going to have bearings on most other pieces of your theological construct. This is a foundational question that must be answered on faithful deconstruction. My, my blog, um, where I talk about deconstruction and help guide people through their deconstruction journey, my metaphor of the house that's being deconstructed, God is the foundation. Mm -hmm. And so how you make up God, how powerful he is, how knowledgeable he is, how present he is, how gracious he is, how violent he is, how oppressive he is, all these questions about God, those become foundational premises that you build constructs of Jesus and the Holy Spirit on. And so each one of us have to place God somewhere on there. And in the conversation of transcendence is knowledge and power.